1112 is when we're doing engine performance 1112. Uh, we're in, we're pretty well on track on target with our emissions test. I'm going to be throwing you guys some final exams. They may not be that long because I want everybody to get through with their final exam early enough so they can see what their overall grade looks like because I don't like to be right down at the end of the wire and you take your final exam and now all of a sudden, oh no, I've got an F because I didn't do enough worksheets. That way you'll have time to, you know, I mean, I'm going to have some people like that in here because there wasn't enough worksheets that were being done. You know, I was, uh, like I was telling him about the Hunter Brown and the other thing, there was another guy that I could never get to do worksheets. He was a, he's one of these live work only guys. That's all he wanted. He wasn't interested in doing any of the worksheets. And when I put him to work out there in the real world, uh, there was a ton of worksheets he didn't do that he was supposed to do. He didn't know how to do ball joints. He didn't. There's all kinds of crap that he didn't learn because he didn't see any point in it. It was a waste of his time if it wasn't live work. He done well. He did a lot of live work. He did it good. And he learned a lot on that. But there was a lot of stuff he just absolutely had no knowledge of whatsoever because he refused to do the worksheets. If you refuse to do the worksheets, it's going to cost you. I mean, that's just all there is to it. If you want to be a well-rounded person with good foundational knowledge. The sensor that most determines fuel delivery, this is engine performance 2 test 11, 12. The engine, uh, the sensor that most determines fuel delivery when a fuel injected engine is first started is which one? When it's first started, think about that. Most determines fuel delivery. Engine coolant temperature. If it's colder, it's going to need more fuel. That's why you have a choke on a carburetor. You turn the key on, it looks at engine coolant. Intake air temperature, that's got something to do with it, it too. It's really hard to start a truck. It's got a carbureted engine if the jump doesn't work. Yeah, you can pat the gas in, but it won't stay alive without feathering the throttle usually. And we, I mean, I, all the years I worked on carburetors, you know, that was the most common thing that we worked on was how bad they ran cold. You know, you always had to figure out a way to, you know, make a choke. I mean, heck, I could talk all day about carburetors, you know, but carburetors are just about gone now. What happens to the voltage measured at the engine coolant temperature sensor when the thermostat opens? When the thermostat opens, you're looking at your scan tool. You want to see if the thermostat is actually working. So what happens to it when the thermostat opens? It's going to act, the voltage is actually going to increase, but the temperature reading will decrease. Right? So if you've got a cooler engine, see, so the, the cooler, uh, when you first look at your voltage of your engine coolant temperature sensor, when you first get in the car, you switch it on, you're going to look at all of the sensors that are measuring anything temperature related. Transmission oil temperature, intake air temperature, engine coolant temperature, they all, all read the same. Because what? The second law of thermodynamics, heat's flowed to cold, everything's going to be the same temperature. When you first fire it up, and they're all going to be reading, depending on temperature outside, you know, from 2 to 3 volts or something like that. I mean, I don't give you the exact number, but it's pretty close. As it warms up and it gets down to where the thermostat opens, it's usually around 6 tenths of a volt. So the voltage goes down as the temperature goes up. They're, you know, that's because you've got a negative temperature coefficient sensor, and the resistance of that sensor is shortened more and more and more of that signal voltage away as the resistance decreases with the temperature increasing. Positive temperature coefficient is when temperature and resistance increase together. That's like a starter cable or something like that. You expect that. But they deliberately design engine coolant temperature sensors uh, so that you know, in any kind of thermistor you're using in a situation like that so that it won't go down. Resistance goes down when heat goes up. Uh, so it increases slightly when the thermostat opens. Why does it do that? Because of the cold water that's actually been in the, it's, it's been, I say the cold water, the water that's cooler that's in the radiator is actually going to be pulled through and it's going to, you know, cool that sensor off a little bit. You get cold water, like I'm talking about chilled water, mm -hmm. and pour it directly into an engine. Mm -hmm. Can it crack the head? Yeah, it can. Yeah. It darn sure can. It really, it's really a, a good idea to have the engine running when you pour the water in there so that it will be mixing with the other water and circulating your left side. A truck mine, he's a super genius, went to the store, truck, truck and run hot, and that's a small radiator lead. He goes to the store and gets five bottles out of the cooler. Mm -hmm. Goes out there, pours them all in the radiator, starts to drive. When he gets back, there's head for it. Yeah, that's correct. I'll tell you, this one guy, too, these people took a uh, this just married business and they took some fish and they put it on the guy's intake manifold or exhaust manifold on his V8 engine or whatever. Just kind of crammed them fish down in there and they were just stinking like you wouldn't believe. You know how they stink, you know. When it, and so uh, he, he got to where he was going, you know. He popped the hood and he, you know, got a cloth and he jerked him fish out of there. And then he got the water hose. Whoosh, 
and he cracked his exhaust manifolds because they were hot, and he hit them with cold water, you know. Here's another thing that can happen. This guy comes out there, he fires his car up so it'll be warm when he gets back in there, right? In other words, it's cold outside, frost on the ground. He wants the car to warm up so when he gets in there, he can slide into a nice warm car, right? So he cranked the car up, but he forgot to turn on heat, defrost, or anything. And yeah, the car's nice and warm, but that gum glass is still, you know, fogged up. Well, I'll take care of that right quick. So he throws that sucker on defrost, and when that hot air from goes up there and hits that cold glass, you know, windshield's all busted. You won't ever think about that happening, but and it may not happen every time. You know, it's like saying, well, I did that every day and didn't have a bit of a problem. Then you mention that to your neighbor and he cracks his glass. You know, so somebody's going to pay for that. It depends on what vehicle you got and what kind of glass they put yep. in there. They were Volkswagen uh, Type 4, the 411 Volkswagens. They had a gasoline-fired heater. And uh, all you did, you turned this knob, it was a timer. Yanked. And it was, it was a 45-minute timer. And when you turn that timer, even without out the car running or anything, that heater would go, Oof. and it would fire up like a little... And uh, so you go back in the house, and 45 minutes later, when you go out and get in the car, the engine hasn't even started, and that car is toasty warm on the inside. Well, fixing those daggum things is a pain. They got a spark plug, a little capacitor, and that, what down there. And uh, it's actually had it would take some gas. It would borrow some gas from the gas tank, and it would mist it into this, you know, past this spark plug, and have a little like a, you know, smush pot, or whatever you call a heater. I'll dog on it. They make them heaters that look like a turbine thing, and. You know, that blow like yeah. contractors use, and it was supposed to work like that. Now, the heat, the gas fumes didn't go inside the car, but the heat did, you see. I mean, that actually was, but one way or another, it was cool, but it was hard to fix those when they quit working. And I had to work on some of them when I was a Volkswagen dealer, but that was, gosh, that was a long time ago. All right. Two technicians are discussing a stepped engine coolant temperature circuit. Technician A says the sensor used for a stepped circuit is different from the one used in a non stepped circuit. Technician B says a stepped circuit uses different internal resistance inside the PCM. That's number three. Uh, technician B is the only one right on that. The stepped sensor. Now, what is a stepped sensor? Let me tell you what a stepped sensor is. Huh? It's a Hall effect sensor. No, no, no. It's not that. If you went to that old mobile out there and you looked at the, and you're, let's say you're monitoring the engine coolant temperature sensor voltage, and let's say you're plotting it on a graph right there like this. Okay, you're going to start up at what I say, like, you know, if this is your 5 volts and you're going to go 4, 3, you're going to start out right here. Is that voltage. When it hits a certain voltage? When it gets to a certain voltage, you're going to see it going down as the engine warms up. And then all of a sudden, it's going to get here where it looks like it's going to go off the bottom of the graph, and it's going to shift gears, and it's going to go back up, and then it's going to go down again. That is a step sensor. The Oldsmobile does that. Chrysler's do that. If you're looking at that voltage, you're going to be really confused. If you don't understand it, you may have a step sensor. If you look at the, if you've got the voltage and the actual temperature pulled up, you know, you can either look at either one on your scan tool display. Your scan tool temperature will keep going up. But this thing shifts gears because they want some more resolution. When you get to a low, certain low voltage, they're thinking, well, we need to have it a tighter resolution than, you know, having this thing level off. So we're going to go ahead and put a, some different circuits inside it when it gets to a certain level it's actually going to start reading you know different i mean i got a drawing of how that's wired on the inside of the computer but that's really a waste of your time basically you just need to know that if you got a stepped coolant temperature sensor and the coolant temperature sensor as far as i know is the only one that stepped that way i don't think intake air temperature sensors or transmission fluid temperatures i could be wrong about that but i have never seen a stepped transmission fluid temperature sensor if you're looking at the numbers on your uh, scan tool that tell you actually what the temperature is, you're probably not going to have issues with that. We're just on question number three, Jeremy, so you ain't bad off. Uh, when testing an engine coolant temperature sensor on a vehicle, a digital multimeter can be used as a signal wire's back probe. I did that. I started doing that whenever we were working. Uh, when I was, I went to uh, Ford's Electronic Engine Control School in 1986. And they taught us how we could use that H manual and we could go through all these little pinpoint tests and all that kind of junk. And I worked with it. And when I got back, I tried to, I tried for a solid week to use that darn thing and I could not fix a single car with that stupid H manual. I'm sorry. You know, if Ford is listening to this video, I am just sorry. But what I started doing was I'd get a voltmeter. We didn't have data stream in those days. We could pull codes, but we didn't have data stream. Now, General Motors, to their credit, they had data stream ever since something like 1984 or something, or 83, whatever it was. They got data stream early on. It was really great. 
But I would back probe that sensor, and I want to poke a hole in the wire if I can help it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to try to go right down in between the, the little rubber seal and the sensor, and I'm going to get on that metal if I had to use a paper clip or whatever. I even made a long probe that had a yeah, shrink tube and all the way up that thing. I used a piece of coat hanger, sharpened it off real sharp on the end, and fixed it where I could use it to back probe them. And then I would actually do a uh, put an alligator clip on the other end so I hook that to my meter and I could work it down. If I could see that sensor, I could get to it. I'd go in there and I'd read that voltage. And I started measuring voltage on every darn car I worked on. And I was working on pretty much the same make model car. But I got to where I understood what all those voltages were supposed to be and how it was supposed to act at various different dynamics. And when I got to where I understood all of that, I started fixing cars just left and right. People bring a car in there and they say, this is going on, that's going on. I say, boop, 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 this is what's wrong with it. Push, pull, snap, click, boom, test drive, and we're done. That was on the yard. I got another one in there. That's how I fixed 12, 15 cars a day. You know, three or four, three to 5,000 cars a year when I was, uh, you know, getting them where they run, run good and didn't, didn't puff out black smoke and didn't surge and didn't stall at idle and all that. But I did it by measuring the voltage. And the funny thing about it was it's got it. This old man brought a car over there that was a tempo, had a little idle speed control on it. And that thing had four wires going to it. Two of the wires operated the motor that was against the throttle plate, or, you know, lever, and two of them were actually an idle tracking switch. So the, the computer needs to know when you're off idle or when you're idling, right? And so that idle tracking switch, whenever the, uh, is a little tiny switch down inside that thing, and when that throttle lever would touch it, you know, it had a little 12 volt, no current there, but it had a little 12 volt uh, signal going to that switch. And whenever that idle tracking switch, when that throttle lever touched the idle tracking switch, it would open that connection and you see 12 volts on that wire. Well, if you measured the resistance of that idle tracking switch, it ought to be zero ohms when it's, you know, when your foot's off the, you know, when you're off the throttle. And when you let it touch, it ought to be, you know, open. And I would see them that when it was supposed to be straight, you know, shorted, I would be looking at uh, like 40, 50 ohms. And this little thing right here cost like $50. No, how much was it? It was more than that. It was like 130 bucks or something like that, a little idle speed control. I got one laying around here somewhere. They quit using them back in the 80s. But the, the thing about it is, uh, I got to where I, when I'd check one of them, if I checked one of them and it needed one, that's where I'd stop. Particularly if it had a problem related to stalling. It could also make them lose power going down the road, make it feel like I had a bad fuel pump too, but I didn't find that out until later. But this guy came over here and he says, what do you need for this? This car's cutting off and all that. So I get over here and I check them. And I said, it, it needs one of these. He says, gosh, that's a lot of money. Can't we look somewhere else for the problem? <laughs> Well, if you find something you know is wrong and it can cause what you're doing, you need to do that and then you need to verify your repair. It's just the way you do things, you know. All right. Got off of here. All right, let me see. Technician, t t when testing an ECT central vehicle, digital multimeter can be used in a wired black back probe. That is right. What settings should you use to test the sensor on your meter? Ohms, DC volts, hertz, or AC volts? Number four. That's going to be DC volts. You guys know that. DC volts is not AC volts. AC volts is only like on a wheel, wheel speed sensor or something like that. Hertz would be on a map sensor like on that Bronco out there. And uh, you don't use no ohms when you're checking volts. Okay. Uh, when checking the ECT sensor with a scan tool, what temperature should be displayed if the connector is removed from the sensor with the key on engine off? Actually, that's going to be 40 below zero. You might notice on the line D, on the D there for that answer, 40 below Fahrenheit and 40 below Celsius is the same thing. That's where they cross. So if I ever ask you, if I said this was 40 below zero Celsius, what would that be in Fahrenheit? You better not look at me and say, duh, I don't know. You know, because they're the same thing, 40 and 40. Got that? You've heard that before, ain't you, Jeremy? Yeah. When was that? All right. Skip number five. When testing the engine coolant temperature sensor with the connector disconnected, you're going to use ohms for that. That ain't real complicated, right? That's number five. Number seven. Two technicians discussing the intake air temperature sensor. Technician A says the IET sensor is more important to the operation of the engine than the engine coolant temperature sensor. Now, there was a time when it was a heck of a lot more important, you know what I'm saying, than it is now. Um, and technician B says the PCM will add fuel if the IET indicates the incoming air uh, temperature is cold. Got that? Technician B is right about that. And I will tell you, and I mentioned that Dodge truck one time. They had an open intake air temperature sensor, and the temperature outside was like 40 degrees. It was on a Dodge pickup truck, and it was OBD2, 
And that doggone thing uh, enhanced part of that thing, the computer. If it sees an open intake air temperature sensor, it will substitute a temperature of about 101 degrees because it feels like that's probably going to work best in all. I mean, well, that's okay unless it's a cold day. So if the engine coolant temperature sensor is reading 40 degrees because the thing been sitting out here and it's kind of chilly outside, and that intake air temperature sensor is open, and it's reading what it ought to be reading 40 below, but it's not because the computer smart aleck programmer said, well, we're going to substitute 110 degrees if we got an open sensor because that will probably work. In this case, it didn't. You had a cold engine. You had 100. And it's telling me we got a freezing cold engine. And we got really hot air. We're going to treat it that way. Well, the air wasn't really hot. It was 40 degrees too. And so it put too much. Huh? Heck no! It's putting too much fuel in there when you're trying to start it. It wet that gun plugs. You spin. It's puffing out smoke. Well, the crazy thing about that dodge when it came into the body shop, it was warm weather. They had just about rebuild it or anything because somebody had, they. I don't know what happened, but it just had lots of body damage. So it came in there in the warm late part of the summer when it when the temperature was close to 100 degrees, and that was fine. You had to start just fine every time. You had to check engine light. But the cool, interesting thing about that one was it had a brand spanking new intake air temperature sensor on it. And the way that probably played out was they went and pulled a code somewhere, maybe in the parts house, put an intake air temperature sensor in it. It was bad, off the shelf pull the same code and says, well, it's not really causing a problem. I'll just drive it that way. Well, as soon as you had a cold snap, the darn thing don't start. Now, if somebody's talking about one that was running okay and now it's a cold snap and it won't start, you need to be looking at those temperature sensors and making sure they read the same thing. Anyway. Hey, whenever you get something bad from the Yeah, it happens sometimes. But at the same time, what I did on that one was I got my little potentiometer, which is potentiometer like one of these. You see the little potentiometer right there? It's basically that little potentiometer. You can actually turn that knob. This one here is basically a 1,000 ohm potentiometer. That's not suitable for what I'm talking about. You need one that'll read. It's about 50,000 ohms, and you hook up to two of these wires on this pot, uh, on the pot that's like a 50,000 ohm temper. You know, and and you can dial whatever temperature you want. If you're looking at the scan tool in there. See that little those two wires right there? You got three wires on that potentiometer. And if you hook up to that one and one of the ones in the middle, either on either side, when you turn that knob, that resistance is going to change. And you can actually look at your scope. I'm going to show you all this. Yes, uh, Tuesday, and I forgot to do it. When you fire up that Oldsmobile, I can hook up to the engine coolant temperature sensor. I can dial that temperature, and you can watch on the scan tool as that temperature changes while I'm turning the knob. See? And I got a little black project box, and I put can one of these in. You make the fans it. kick on and off like You sure can. That's exactly what I was talking about. On that particular Dodge, though, I dialed it until it, the temperature is matched. In other words, I matched the dialing this that is hooked to the two wires with two of these. I dialed it in, and whenever my scan tool said they were both reading about 40 degrees, mm -hmm. fired right up. And I knew what was wrong with it. Anyway. Can you hook the intake air temperature to the potentiometer and dial it or whatever? Any, any sensor like that, any sensor that has a, uh, you know, that is a thermistor, anything that changes its resistance to change its signal, you can connect a potentiometer to it and uh, change it. In other words, you're going to disconnect the wires from the sensor, you know, and just hook the two wires from this without damaging the wire harness. You don't cram the terminals, you know, you know, fix stuff way down in there and spread those terminals. But you just basically put a real gentle little, or you can back probe it. But don't have it plugged into the sensor or you'll just confuse it. You want to have it where this is your sensor and you're controlling the resistance. See, this doesn't cost much. You can buy these darn things at Radio Shack for not much money. They sell them every day. And you want one with the right resistance. This one here is just a 1,000 ohm. That's not suitable for anything I'm talking about doing because it doesn't have enough resistance. Because you need to have, you know, 20, 30,000 ohms, you know, to play with on that. But you can watch out real careful whenever you're turning your scan tool. That's the most useful tool. I started doing that. I don't know if anybody else that did that unless I showed them how to do it. There may be a lot of people out there. They used to have gauge testers that had three of these in it. And you could actually set all three of them. They were wired in series, so you could pick any resistance you wanted. Those work for that, too. But, you know, that's a kind of a big thing. I like having a little something. Never mind. I kind of went on for a while on that. Good stuff. Um, let me see. No, it's number seven. We've already done that one. That one that would be number eight. If the transmission fluid temperature sensor indicates cold automatic transmission fluid, 
what would a PCM do to the shifts? What would it do to the shifts? It would have delayed shift points and a torque converter clutch would be disabled. See, the torque converter clutch, what is it? What has the torque converter clutch got to do with temperature? It will, but where does the heat, the it transmission? Up the heat in the torque the, well, the torque converter actually is where the heat's created. You know, just about all the heat in an automatic transfer, huh? Because the pressure. Because of the, uh, you got there's those uh, the turbine and the impeller, they're shearing that fluid all the time, and it heats it up. That's what it does basically. It's almost like a you know a liquid turbocharger or something. But anyway, it actually whenever that's shearing that fluid. The heat, but because when the torque converter, when the fluid leaves the torque converter, it goes straight, straight to the transmission cooler, and when it comes back from the transmission cooler, it goes into the wall, the transmission wall pin. See, all right. So uh, they're wanting, rather than lock in the torque converter, they're going to let it shear the fluid and warm the transmission up quicker, because you want the fluid to be nice and you know thin, you know like you want it to be like thin as gasoline. You know, it needs to be transmission fluid have those properties, but it needs to be thin so it can do its work more snappy. If the transmission fluid is cold, the, com the computer's got to do other things. You know, it's got to actually change the shift scheduling and do other stuff, and it won't let the torque convert. Yeah. I think it's got to get to 170 degrees on most of them before the torque converter will actually begin to lock it up. Doesn't take very long. Shift burner. Well, yeah, you're gonna. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. It depends on the way the transmission set up. My sister's from the car, so when we first got it, you drive down the road in third gear and it shift back to second by itself, put you in the dash. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the problem with it was. But a PO-118 diagnostic trouble code is being discussed. Technician A says the engine coolant temperature sensor could be internally shorted. The what? In coolant, uh, PO-118 DCC. Technician B says the signal wire could be open. Which technician is correct? Is it technician A, technician B, C? That's one thing. If you're if you're reading the book, you'll know what a PO18 PO118 DC is. That basically is technician B. All right. Okay, that was question number nine about that PO118 DTC. Number ten in the illustration below. What type of circuit is depicted? Is it a step-up transformer? an O2S sensor circuit, a positive temperature coefficient thermistor circuit, or a negative temperature coefficient circuit. I'm going to show you the picture right here. Which one is positive. it? Which, huh? It's positive. Positive temperature coefficient. What do those words say? Positive temperature coefficient. No, I mean the words that you got over here next to the schematic. What do they say? Higher voltage when sensor is cold. Wait. Okay, so what no, was no, I just no, talking about a while ago? Remember what I said? Just about every sensor we use that, I've, that I know about on any of these cars are negative temperature coefficient. Got it? All right. And so that one there is going to be a negative temperature coefficient circuit. I understand that. The intake air temperature sensor is being tested after the vehicle has been allowed to cool for several hours. The scan tools used to observe IET and compare it to engine coolant temperature. The two temperatures should be within how many degrees Fahrenheit of each other? It's going to be really close. Isn't it? Five? Five degrees? If the sun is shining on the hood and it's warmed up the engine compartment a little, you may have a little bit of difference on the engine coolant. And the transmission fluid may be cooler than it's sitting there. Tell you something else too, like on these power stroke diesels and you know these other things. If you've got pressure sensors um, and nothing's been started, and the pressure sensors like a exhaust pressure and you know fuel rail pressure and all that, if it's been sitting there for a pretty good while, they ought to pretty much close be pretty close to the same thing too. Typically speaking, you know, and just throwing that out there. I mean, just use your brain when you're looking at this stuff. You can think about it, figure it out. Uh, let's see. The which sensor is typically considered to be the electronic accelerator pump of a fuel injected engine? Just throwing it out there. Electronic accelerator. What does the accelerator pump do? If you look on this 350 we got out here, the old one that's got a carburetor on it that we do all the distributor stuff on. If you crack the throttle, it's going to spray gas in there. So what is it that's telling us we cracked the throttle? Throttle sensor. The throttle position sensor, that's right. When you operate the throttle position sensor, a fuel injected engine needs the same doggone thing a carbureted engine needs. It needs extra fuel whenever you're changing the throttle angle. You're going to have extra fuel injector squirts 
when you break, when you crack the throttle. You don't just expand the pulse width. You have extra squirts. See, ordinarily you got your squirts timed according to crankshaft resolution. If you listen to that injector, and you guys have all listened to injectors in here, or we're looking at no stars and all this kind of junk, or if we're trying to see if the injector is the cause of a cylinder skipping, and you listen to it with your stethoscope, what does the injector sound like? Click, 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 and as you speed the engine up, it goes click, 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 it speeds up faster, but it's always following the cadence of the engine. Well, if you happen to be listening to that thing, when somebody cracks the throttle, it, it goes, <laughs> I mean, it actually buzzes a little bit uh, on that. Let me uh, pause for a second here and answer this phone. Okay, um, now then, so... You know, typical throttle position sensor voltage at idle is about what? Uh, well, the people that write these books are really friendly to GM cars. They like GM cars better than they do anything else. So a lot of the times they'll actually use the GM car as the platform for their... And this says 0.5 volts or 10% of wide open throttle uh, sensor voltage. That's what they're looking for. If you look at a Ford, you're going to see one volt really close to one volt. And the first thing I used to do was go into the throttle position sensor with a back probe it with my meter. If I saw about one volt, if I worked this meter, if I worked the throttle position sensor through its sweep really, you know, slow, I ought not to see it drop out. Now if I'm seeing voltage it's going, you know, one, two, three, and it's counting up in between and all that, and then all of a sudden it drops back to one whenever it's up between two and three and then it goes back to three, I know I got a throttle position sensor that needs to be replaced. If it does that while you're driving, it would go, <laughs> and if it doesn't drop completely out of that, you know, one volt, to, you know, out of the range a computer will accept, and that's an in-range failure. It won't throw you a code if you got an in-range failure. I mean, you can actually have an in-range failure in a throttle position sensor, and it not throw any code at all, but it'll still be a bad TP sensor. So you know, that don't mean that you need to just throw a TP sensor at everyone that comes in the door. But at the same time, it's always good. Donnie was always funny to me how he would double check everything. What I would do, if I drove one that felt like a DP sensor, and I measured it with my meter, and I ran it through one time, and dropped it back, and I saw it drop out, it got a sensor. It got a sensor, I redrove it, I retested it, and I put it back on the yard, if that's all it was in there for. Donnie was not going to do that. Donnie would check this, he'd see it drop out, he'd fool with the connector, he'd unplug the connector, he'd look at the pins, he'd fool with the pins, he'd wiggle all the pin wires, he'd try to do it, you know, he'd thump on the sensor. You know, just <laughs> he was just trying to make sure that he verified every last little element of but, you know, so he had a laugh. But I mean, uh, to me, I'm going to look at it, and if I get an indication it's bad and that's what's causing the problem, the first thing they're going to get is a new sensor. I will tell you why. Sometimes, if you say, well, he doesn't need a TP sensor, I'm just going to fix this wire, then it, he comes back, he did need a TP sensor, now he's wanting a freebie. See what I'm saying? You know, you're better off to, if you suspect the TP sensor for a solid reason, put one on it. If he needs the wire harness repaired later, he can come back and you can do that. But I told you all this before, too. Occasionally, you'll have one that the wires, they look crimped. They look like they're, you know, where they, uh, the wires, uh, you unpin the little terminals, and you look at where the wires are crimped. And those little wires look just as clean as a whistle. But on these little tiny bit of voltages that come out of these TP sensors, that voltage can be wrong. And if you've got, like, the... Uh, Signal return voltage has got resistance, and sometimes you'll come back to idle, and it won't release itself. Like whenever you give it gas, it opens up the idle air control some, so that when you let off the gas, it can let the idle air control come back slowly, so it doesn't stall the engine. It's called dash pot function. Well, if you don't, if it doesn't know you've let off, it'll still be holding that dash pot function, and you may stop at a traffic signal. It may go, ah, let me run it too fast. Well, a lot of times, something throw an idle air control motor on. That ain't going to fix a darn thing because all it's doing is what it's told. And so what we used to do, you could look at that, pull your scan tool up, you look at it, and when you stop and it's revving up too high, you look at your little uh, PID for throttle position and say PT, which means part throttle. If it's still saying part throttle and you ain't got your foot on the gas, we would take those uh, wires out of the connector, make sure that we had them sticking up like this, and then we would solder those little places very neatly with a good hot soldering iron. You solder those places where the wires were crimped. In spite of the fact that they look good and they look clean and all that kind of stuff, make sure you get a good pin fit in your TP sensor that, so you don't want it flopping around. And snap those back in the connector and plug them back in and about nine times out of ten that would take care of that problem. 
Sometimes on mass airflow, you have a mass airflow code, and all you have to do is un un unpin those wires, solder them, put them back. That's a surgical repair, basically. And if you're doing that kind of stuff, you're you're a real you're one of the cowboys that knows what how to you know uh, brand if you can do that. Okay, now then. Uh, TP sensors, which one of these sensor types? You know, it's a potentiometer. A rheostat actually carries current, you know, a potentiometer basically sends a signal. Which of these sensors does the TP sensor back up if the PCM determines a failure has occurred? Either B or C. Map or mouse, you yeah. know. All right. We got pretty good questions. This is advanced engine performance. We got to, you know, cover this stuff. Which wire on a typical TP sensor should be back probe to check the uh, voltage signal of the PCM? You want to go to what? You don't want to go to the reference because it ain't going to change, right? Reference voltage is going to stay 5 volts. Uh, the ground wire is going to stay ground if everything's like it's supposed to be. Uh, you, don't re you don't connect it between 5 volt reference and ground because that's just going to give you 5 volts all the time. The signal wire is the one that goes up and down. The signal wire is actually the one that's hooked to the wiper goes up and down inside the sensor. After a throttle position sensor has been tested using the min minimum maximum function on a DMM, you know what that is? Anybody know? Minimum maximum function? Test it to see if they'll do zero and if they'll do 100%. No, no. <laughs> Only your meter, you'll have min, max, and current. Well, that's good. It'll actually usually be like this. Where it may say live right there or something like that. And meanwhile, up here, you know, your your current reading is actually going to be changing as you do things. Uh, this right here will be the lowest reading it has seen. And this will be the highest reading it has seen. Now, why is that useful? Sometimes these glitches happen fast enough or while you've looked away or while you've been sneezing or something like that. And let's say that you're, you're reading. 1.0 here for your minimum because that was idle, and you've done a wide open throttle a couple of times whenever you were you know going up through, and now you're reading 4.5 over here for your max, and your current because you're cruising down the road is reading you know 2.2, and up here in your big display you're going to see 2.2 volts right, I'm just writing this like that, okay now all of a sudden while you're driving down the road, the darn thing is does this. And you look over at your meter, and it's still reading 2.2. But what has changed? This is now down to 0 0.2. And that's it's aha. It picked up a dropout. Got it? You understand now what minimum current and maximum is good for? You can have this hooked to anything that you're checking on any car. Even if you're looking at the AC volts that's being put out by the crank sensor. Got it? Or a wheel speed sensor or something like that. If you've got your, your current is going to match, that's going to match this. This is going to stay at whatever the most. Well, what if all of a sudden you felt a buck jerk and this increases to five volts? You got a problem there too. That could be a sensor. It could be a wire harness. If the signal return going into that sensor, which is your ground, if it briefly opens up for some reason or another, you're going to see five volts right here. But wherever this goes, it's, this is recording the lowest it's been, this is recording the highest it's been. That is a tremendous diagnostic tool, and everybody needs to know how to use that. A lot of the problems that I've got with people that call me for help and, and students and all that kind of stuff is you be uh, digging into a problem that you need to gather more data in order to make a good decision, but they don't want to do that. What they want to do is hack around, figure it out without gathering data, and maybe just guess at a good part. You know, so people call me, or send, don't call me, but they send me emails from my website. And they'll say, uh, what do you think might be causing this? Well, woe to them if I happen to mention a part. Because whatever part I mention, they don't read any of the other text that I send. They just rush out and buy that part. Because they want to just grab a part and plug it in. Okay, and, and that's, a lot of mechanics do that. And sometimes... Mechanics that really don't understand troubleshooting will throw parts at one until they finally get lucky, and then they'll charge them for every part they put on there, and then you got a thousand dollar repair bill for something that just needed a you know fifty dollar sensor, and then a you know customer has to choke it down and you know mortgage their bicycle or whatever to get you know money. All right, now which one? Which one are we on here? That's I said number sixteen, the signal wire. 
after a TP sensor has been tested using minimum maximum function, reading of zero volts is displayed. That's the 17. That's what we're talking about. Um, what is that, guys? Huh? TP sensor is open at one point during the test. Technically, if there's things are moving around, it could be a wire harness problem. That's when they're on. All right, let's do a little quicker. If a TP sensor has been tested during the uh, in the min max function and five volts is displayed, I was talking about up there. Um, Basically, you know, 18 is going to be, they're saying it's both B and C. I'm submitting that you could have a wire harness problem there. Um, of course, they're saying a TP sensor is shorted to 5 volts reference and all that. As long as you understand those three wire sensors, this is not rocket science. If a technician attaches one lead of a digital meter to the ground terminal of the TP sensor and the other meter to lead the negative terminal of the battery, the technician is turned on, the engine off the meter displays 37.3 millivolts. Technician A says this is a signal voltage and it's a little low. Technician B says the TP sensor ground circuit has excessive resistance. Listen, listen to what I'm telling you. That is the kind of question you're going to see on an ASC test. That's the kind of question you're going to see. What are you doing when you go to the ground circuit on the TP sensor and the ground on the battery? What have we been talking about in here? Voltage drop. If you've got voltage drop between the battery ground and the signal return circuit on the sensor, you're actually going to be checking the integrity of that signal return circuit. It could be bad inside a computer, it could be bad in a connector, it could have a wire problem. So that is an extremely important thing to understand. There's not one mechanic in 50 that ever does a voltage drop test on the ground side or on these sensor circuits. They don't ever think about that. But it's supposed to be a dead short to ground. Matter of fact, I have had them where something had fried the signal return circuit inside the computer. And just to get to get by for a little bit, I've actually took the signal return and hooked it to the ground on the in the battery ground, and I'll get it going again. What happens if your signal return is open? Every daggum sensor is reading high. I mean, your engine coolant, your intake air temperature, throttle position sensor is reading five volt. I mean, everything's all screwed up. Then, how's the, what's the computer going to know what to do? All those voltages are off the line, everything. Um, anyway, you guys deserve kudos for being here today. Whenever it's been a it's a day after a holiday because that is uh, that shows integrity and I appreciate that. Just make sure you don't bail out early on me today. All right, number. Uh, let me see. Okay, PO122 DTC is received retrieve using a scan tool. This one means what? What does it mean? The 120. That means all of the above. That means the TP sensor voltage low could be shorted to ground. The TP signal circuit should be shorted to ground. You know. So if you short these signal wires to ground, the voltage goes away. Technician A says the three wires on the TP sensor are 5 volt reference. One of them is 5 volt reference. That's what he said. Uh, technician B says a TP sensor, come on in here, girl, uh, is a three wire variable resistor called a rheostat. Uh, which technician is correct? Huh? Okay, number 21. No, that's actually going to be number A. Okay. Huh? A is a letter? A is a letter? They killed the dog. Huh? Yeah, technician A, that's the one. Okay, let me pause for a second. You guys take a breather. The TP sensor affects the operation of all of the following except what? Which one? It does not correct for lean and rich air fuel mixture. A typical throttle position sensor registers how many volts at wide open throttle. What did I write up here? About four and a half. STP. TP center, four and a half. 